Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this uh, session. It's our first regional uh, webinar uh, with Education USA and the participation of Mike Rossi, Michael Rossi from California Culture of Arts. Um, as you can see, uh, you are muted and also your video is turned off. You will remain like that um, because uh, there is no requirement for interaction, but please feel free to type your questions. Um, when Mike goes to, to the topic and he explains everything about uh, the topic of today, if you have any question at any time, please feel free to type it through the chat uh, during the session and we will respond at the end of, of the webinar. Uh, either if it is related to Education USA or uh, the topic itself. And this session is being recorded. And so you will find um, uh, in YouTube, in the YouTube channel of Education USA Mexico or Education USA Global, you will find this session if you want to, to watch it again, or if you want to share it with someone that is also interested in uh, pursuing uh, the studies in the US. So um, the topic of today is how to create an effective visual arts portfolio. Um, our co-host is uh, California College of the Arts. Uh, and as I said, uh, Michael Rossi, he's Assistant Director of International Enrollment in California College of the Arts. And he is today uh, with us in order to talk more about this. But before that, I will introduce Education USA to all of you. We see, we're very glad to see uh, people uh, that registered to this session from Mexico, from Peru, from Senegal, uh, people that is already uh, living in the USA, from Ecuador, Turkey as well, Guatemala. So we are very happy that uh, if you are also visiting virtually this session from any other country, welcome again. Uh, my name is Marta Beltran and I am Education USA Advisor uh, in Mexico City. Um, and uh, talking about Education USA, Education USA is a great global network of advising centers around the world. And we are part of the US State Department's Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs, ECA. So we are not um, working as an independent agency. We are part of the US government and we are also your free access to introductory information on US study. So we will give you information about the whole process uh, when you want to apply to study in the US. Education USA advising centers, as I said, are around the world. We are more than 430 uh, in, in the world and in more than 175 countries. So you will be able uh, to find your closest advising center. You will be able to go to our official website. Uh, I will, uh, we will show that information uh, at the end of the presentation as well. So where to go in the website and you will be able to find your closest advising center. So you have an advisor that could uh, follow up on your questions and in this whole process. Uh, one of our, our objectives is, of course, promote U.S. higher education around the world. And our target is precisely international students. So to advise people like you, and uh, you are prospect international students. We also uh, help and we support uh, the U.S. higher education community. As I said, we are not committed or having any agreement as an, a, an agency to just some or a couple of universities in the US, but the US higher education community. So all accredited um, institutions, US institutions. And we are also working in collaboration with local educational institutions. So in your country, uh, you will find perhaps some of the schools uh, that are in touch with Education USA. Uh, an example in Mexico, for instance, we work with counselors. So those counselors in those schools in your particular country will be giving you also advice and information when you want to study in the US. 
Now, talking about uh, the uh, services, uh, it's free advice all the time is for free. If you uh, come to us for advising, there will not be any charge at any time. And uh, some of the services that we will provide to you is uh, precisely provide accurate, comprehensive, and current information about the full range of accredited U.S. higher education institutions, just like today. And we will always plan and organize and uh, deliver a lot of webinars and events uh, like, such, uh, as, as, um, like this one with uh, relevant topics of your interest. So uh, the, the events that we are organizing it's informative sessions, info sessions, where we are following uh, the Education USA uh, uh, model, the five steps uh, of the process for application to, uh, to the US. So here, after you get this information, which is orientation and more in-depth information, you can come to us and ask for ask for one-on-one -on -one sessions. So it's then it's an advice, a more personalized and individual advice, um, depending on your case. And we organize webinars like this one, workshops, showcases, seminars. We are part of Mobility First. Uh, Education USA also organize annually at the Educational Fair, and we are part of other Educational Fairs. The way you will find all this is in center, and uh, so you know where to go. Um, our advising centers, educational, uh, Education USA advising centers, are located usually in U.S. embassies and consulates and Fulbright commissions by national centers in universities of your country, nonprofit organizations. Um, just as us in Mexico, Mexico City, we are in, uh, located in an American space, which is the uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin um, Library, which is part of the U.S. Embassy in Mexico. Um, unfortunately, because of the contingency, we are not in presence yet, but when we are able to go to the office, you will find also official materials and guides. So books that will help you uh, to write your essays and uh, to study for your standardized uh, tests and so on. Uh, outre outreach is when we visit uh, local educational institutions and we come with these workshops and showcases or seminars. And we also have participation with other organizations that are uh, actually focused on this kind of uh, events. And virtually, you will find all this virtually, local and regional. And so uh, it's very good to you to, um, to stay tuned uh, on all the webinars and events that we are offering to you. And now I will pass uh, the, the voice to Mike so he can talk about the topic of today to our audience. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you all for joining today. Um, again, my name is Mike Rossi. I am the Assistant Director of International Enrollment at California College of the Arts. And um, pretty much what I'm going to do uh, now is talk to you a little bit about portfolio. At the end of um, that portion of the presentation, I'll talk to you a little bit about the college that I'm representing. Um, and then there will be plenty of time for questions at the end. So we're going to start real basic right at the beginning. What is a portfolio? And essentially it is a selection of your artworks compiled over a period of time that we use, college admissions reps use to determine your performance or your progress. It's really showing your creativity, your personality, um, your abilities and commitments, and it helps us to determine what your potential is. Generally, for a portfolio submission, you can use any artwork that was created in school, in a pre-college program, or anything that you've done independently. And as you can imagine, it is one of the most important parts of an art school application. So the portfolio should be a representation of your best works. And generally, the term that we'll use is your strongest, most recent works. So it should give a little bit of insight into who you are, into your journey, um, things that inspire you, but also show a willingness to challenge yourself a little bit. And I'll talk a little bit more about these individual types of topics in a, in a moment. Sometimes it's not about how well you're creating a piece, but what you're choosing to create that's really showing us as reviewers the most about you. 
you definitely want to think about your artwork as you're creating it. So things that you've learned, um, things that were challenging, or even kind of tracking your progress to see how a piece evolved from the beginning stages through to the end stages of a piece. There are a variety of different approaches to portfolio development. And in general, there is no single right way. Some of this might also be determined on the type of work a particular institution is asking for you to include. However, um, examples of the approaches are things that you see here, but note that this is not an exhaustive list. So there are more options than what you are seeing here. So for example, you can have a focus on a specific medium, say a painting portfolio that highlights abilities in acrylic or oil paint. You can have a more concept driven portfolio exploring things like um, cultural identity or pop culture, um, variations of color or graphic design, photography, things of that nature. You can have a portfolio that revolves more around observational types of work. So life drawing, still life drawing, landscape drawing, things of that nature. Or you might have a breadth portfolio, which could show a variety of different approaches to um, different media, to different subject matter. So sort of a little bit of a mastery of skills ac across different areas. How many pieces or projects that you would include in your portfolio are also determined by the institutions to which you are applying. In general, um, schools are asking for 10 to 20 pieces of artwork. Um, again, and you'll see the note here on the bottom, something that I will repeat several times throughout the presentation. Um, each school is different, so do make sure you're reading requirements and following guidelines carefully. But again, in general, 10 to 20 images is sufficient. You always want to include um, a, several of your strongest pieces, what we would consider your wow pieces. So may, if you've won an award for something, that might be a piece that you consider including. But even if you haven't, pieces that have received good feedback or pieces that you are particularly proud of are things that you definitely want to consider including in a body of work. You might also include works that show a range of interests. Um, in addition to things that are showing core drawing skills or um, other sorts of technical abilities. So again, that diversity of media or diversity of subject matter can be a good thing to consider when pulling your pieces together. Sometimes process work can be a good thing. Some schools like CCA, the institution I represent, um, is really excited about process work. That shows us a little bit about how you're thinking, how you're problem solving, um, and it could uh, really be good insight into your abilities as an artist. Other schools might just want to see completed finished works. Again, so it is important to keep in mind what those requirements are. So if you are trying to get started with building a portfolio and you're still not sure where to begin, um, one thing that you can consider is showing technical ability. So drawing is the backbone of a variety of different programs, anything from animation to illustration, painting and drawing, even graphic design, architecture, interior design, interaction design, those types of programs can all have a foundation in drawing. This ability to really translate things like weight or depth, perspective, shape um, onto a two-dimensional surface. And there's a variety of different ways that can be approached. You see some samples of that here. So everything from an interior space that a student happened to be sitting in and then drew to recreate, um, the piece in the middle, which is a little bit more of an observational drawing of this set of drawers, or the piece on the left, which is a more fantastical drawing, as you can see, but is still playing around with those concepts and ideas of depth and perspective and space. So three different approaches to displaying this technical ability, but three very successful interpretations of this idea. You do want to think about incorporating your story into the portfolio. So if you think about it, aside from your application essay, the portfolio is the best opportunity for us to get to know a little bit more about you. So not only just who you are in general, but things like your culture, things that you like or things that you don't like, anything that is important to you. And there's usually no right or wrong way to go about this either. 
So you can see there are several different approaches from several different students um, kind of tackling this sort of idea of personalizing their work and bringing their story into the piece. So everything from um, this exploration of this series with photography, playing around with um, sort of um, obscuring the face uh, and then kind of revealing some of that here in the last image. This self-portrait, a student who was really interested in her heritage and literature. So this stack of books on her head and um, using the, uh, the words in her native tongue in the background, those types of things are something that you can consider incorporating in a piece. It's certainly okay to be conceptual with your works. And sometimes our ideas are deeper um, than they seem right at first when we sit down to work on something. And these all have various concepts. The piece that I'm going to talk about ha happens to have a particularly deep concept. And you do not need to necessarily have something that as, as deep as, the, as this project I'm going to talk about, but it's again, something to, something for you to think about, something that you can consider as an option. So a student created this feel box, which you see here. Um, the idea for this feel box, for this project, was to have essentially audience participation. So those in the gallery would actually stick their hands into the box, feel around at the objects on the bottom of the box, and then when they pulled their hand out, they would draw what it was they thought they felt. And the idea here is that somebody's background or somebody's experiences would influence the type of things they thought they were feeling in the box. And then this led to further discussion, not just amongst the participants or the viewers within this gallery space, but also with the creator, with the artist as well. So again, that happens to be a little bit of a deeper concept, um, but it really is kind of wide open if you're thinking about those types of conceptual abilities. It's a good idea to consider documenting some of your process, or again, how you got from point A to point B, how you started and how you ended up. Seeing that process or seeing where you ended up in the context of where you began can reveal a lot, again, about how you think as an artist. Um, there are a variety of different ways to do that as well. So what you see here on the left are um, a little bit of a thumbnail sketch with some color swatches that led a student or help lead a student to create this finished illustration. This piece here in the middle, which is from a student's sketchbook, playing around with portraiture and facial expressions. And then the piece here on the right, which is a little bit more of a traditional uh, like industrial design or product design piece. So the student creating this razor, kind of highlighting these areas that are removable or movable within the context of this razor. So as long as you're documenting some of this process, if a school is okay with you showing process work, you might have some of that um, in your back pocket that you can pull out and include. So speaking of documentation, um, that is an integral part of this whole process as well. For the most part, schools are going to want you to submit your work digitally. And there's a platform called Slide Room, which I'll introduce in a moment. But that means if your work is not already digital, you're going to need to scan it in or photograph it. If you're taking photographs of your work, make sure they're good pictures. You don't have to spend money getting things professionally photographed, but you do wanna make sure that the photographs you're taking are clean, they're unobscured, things are well lit, and things are properly oriented. You don't want to submit pieces that are upside down or on their side. Omit anything that's not showing you off in the best possible light. And you don't ever want to include weak work for the sake of having more work. So to go back to that note I mentioned earlier, this idea of 10 to 20 images, if a school is asking for anywhere between 10 to 15 pieces, 12 strong pieces is going to be more impressive than 12 strong pieces and three weak pieces to have 15 images. So you always want to stick with quality over quantity. Make sure you're comfortable speaking about your work. So again, that evolution of your piece from beginning to end, or how satisfied you are with the piece, things you learned while creating the piece, these are all things that you might include in the description that might be helpful when you're writing your artist statement. Um, but at the very least, show us that you are ready to jump into critique culture which is going to be essential in any art and design program, regardless of where you attend college or university. 
be mindful of your presentation. So not only, again, should things be well lit, properly oriented, um, think about the most effective way to capture the works. This can be a little bit challenging with sculpture or three-dimensional pieces, but it's still definitely doable. So as you can see here with 3D objects, um, these students chose to photograph these objects from different angles to give the viewer or us, the reviewers, the opportunity to get a better idea of how the object exists in space. This is also something that a student who created this model um, considered. So photographing this piece from three different angles. So we can, again, get a better idea of that overall object. Photographing 3D works on a white ground with a white background is certainly um, a great way to make sure that you're not detracting from the image at all and that the focus is on the images or the artwork itself. Something else you can consider is photographing work in an environment that's really giving more context or more background to the piece. So this example here, a student created these shoes and photographed them in essentially an urban setting and then had a model wearing the shoes. Um, to kind of show that off as well. So this is, again, another thing that you might consider if you're utilizing three-dimensional work, how its environment um, or how it's being modeled can further support the piece as a whole. So the slide you're seeing now is sort of a behind-the-scenes view of what Slide Room looks like. So Slide Room is the platform that a majority of the art schools in the US will utilize for you to submit your portfolio. It will look a little bit different on your end as a user uploading work, but this will give you again a general idea. What you're seeing here in the middle is the slide of the image. So in this case, the still life drawing that the student created. You really want to make sure that you are not cluttering this image. This is about the size that we will see your artwork on our screens. We can't really zoom in to Slide Room. So you really just want to give as much real estate, as much room as possible to the image itself. The additional pieces of information that Slide Room will ask for will be title, the year that the artwork was completed, the medium used to create the piece, the size, and a description of the work. Some of these are required pieces of information you will have to include, like title and, and size. Um, the description is usually a little bit more of an optional piece. But again, this can be a good area for you to write a sentence or two about your process, about what worked, about what didn't work, about your concept, or about the theme or idea that you were going for when creating this piece. So this goes back to the point I just made about really being ready to talk about your work. We would never encourage you to write essays or paragraphs about each and every piece, but really just a sentence or two in the description area talking about the work that you're presenting can really be beneficial. And some schools really like to see a student that takes the time to write something about the works they are including. These are some examples of what you do not want to do. So the piece up here on the top, the student in uh, used this series of images um, and put them on what they thought was a creative background. This is not really doing the work any favors. So this black background with the, the indigo sort of um, patterns and whatnot behind the piece is a little bit distracting, um, is not really supporting these separate images in the way that the artist hoped. It's really much better to focus on one image maybe two or three if you're trying to show a series. Um, you don't want anything distracting, nothing in the background. Again, you really just want to focus on the individual images themselves. Similarly, similarly on the bottom here, um, this student crammed way too much artwork onto the slide. So remember how I mentioned that we can't zoom in to the slide in Slide Room. It doesn't give us the opportunity to jump in really close and see what these individual photography works look like. So the student really did themselves a disservice because we as the reviewers can't actually see the work. The same thing with these uh, uh, examples of painting that the student has included. So really one image per slide, maybe two or three max, depending upon what it is you're trying to show us. Think about the integrity of your work. 
So you've spent a lot of time creating these pieces, right? Hours or even days, maybe even weeks if it's something big or complicated or really intricate. So you wanna make sure that the way the piece looks when you are uploading your work to Slideroom or whatever platform, that the integrity of the piece, that the integrity of yourself as, as the artist um, has really been justified. So if you spend a lot of time on that piece, don't throw it into a slide where we won't be able to see it. Really make sure that it has the room and the space to shine so that we can really get a good sense of the things that you're doing. Do remember to experiment though. So if you're always you know, drawing, your default is pencil on paper or acrylic paint on canvas, try to step out of your comfort zone a little bit. Something that almost all art and design schools are gonna make you do is um, things you're not comfortable with. So experimenting, exploring, whether that be experimentation with digital media or mixed media, you know, collage types, uh, types of things or incorporating 3D materials and 2D materials together. Maybe it's just a matter of painting on an unexpected surface, found objects. Um, this student happened to be painting portraits and um, hands on concrete from a building that she used to live in, right? So again, playing around with pulling that personal story into the work. But also don't be afraid to have fun. So art should be fun, it should be enjoyable. Hopefully you're here today because you're thinking about art school and hopefully you're thinking about art school because it's something you're passionate about and something that is enjoyable. Um, you know, maybe you've created a, a GIF for your friends or you're playing around with an illustration or storyline that you've created. Um, it's okay to include those things in the portfolio as well. There's plenty of time to be serious uh, later, plenty of time to be laser focused in an area you want to work. It's certainly okay to experiment, to explore and enjoy yourself and have fun in developing your artwork. So some things that you're going to try to wanna make sure you avoid. Um, anime and manga are almost never a good idea to include in a portfolio. The work is generally stylized or overly stylized to begin with, and it's not really showing us original things. Um, it's showing us your version of an already established style. Um, it's certainly okay if you enjoy anime and manga, just like fan art. Um, we don't ever want to discourage you from doing the things that you enjoy or doing the things that you're passionate about. But those things don't really have a place in your college or university portfolio. You really want to stick with original kinds of things. Or again, failing that, displaying technical ability or conceptual kinds of works that show that original voice that you have. Try to stay away from drawing on notebook paper this example you see here. So um, I know, especially now, if you are going to school virtually, it's even more easy to be distracted and doodle in a notebook um, during class or something like that. Um, generally, that again is not really the best representation of your artwork. The lines become distracting, you know, the holes, the, the binder rings or whatnot is not really something we need to see. Now, if this piece was a small thumbnail that was included to show process of a larger completed painting or sculpture, you might consider it. But in general, invest in a sketchbook or even use printer paper, something that is kind of unobscured that gives you that nice clean surface to work on. Um, again, fan art, existing characters, celebrities, you know, every year we see celebrity portraits, Taylor Swift or Katy Perry. We know that um, you're copying those from uh, already established images, other people's photographs. You want to stay away from that in your submission as well. Um, if you like something particular about an image you're seeing in, you know, in a book or something you've seen online or even on social media somewhere, try to recreate that. Um, using your own model, have your mom sit for you or, or your sibling or your cousin or your neighbor can try to light it the same way, play around with the same kinds of colors or compositions, but you don't want to copy somebody else's images. Speaking of digital art and social media, um, screenshots of work are also not really encouraged. So what you see here, the student essentially took a screenshot on their phone and uploaded that piece. Um, that's all extraneous, unnecessary information. All we really care about is the image itself. We don't need to see how much battery you have left, how many likes you got, um, your phone notifications, all of that is irrelevant 
information that will detract from the piece itself. So really make sure you're focusing again on the images that you're creating. That's where you should be highlighting all of your efforts. And again, when it comes to documentation, make sure that those things are being done properly. So this piece on the bottom right hand corner, the student really just wanted us to see these paintings. However, the way this is photographed is not successful. We see glasses on the table, we see the chair over here, the edge of the table, the floor. Um, that's not helping, right? It's detracting from the works. It's making it more difficult to see these images. So again, you really just want to make sure that when you're pulling things together, when you're documenting your work, you're giving, um, you're giving yourself the time and the opportunity to really highlight your skills and abilities in the best light possible. So that's essentially it for the portfolio uh, presentation portion of things. Um, I do encourage you to get a portfolio review, especially if you are in the 10th or 11th grade or you know, just trying to wrap things up, you're in 12th grade and applying for this fall. Um, a portfolio review is a great opportunity to get feedback on your work before you are uploading it for your final portfolio. Um, one way to do this is through uh, ACAD and Slide Room. So ACAD stands for the Association of Independent Colleges of Art and Design. This is essentially 36 of your leading private nonprofit art and design schools in the US and Canada. Um, even though we are essentially competitors of one another, we have comparable mission statements, comparable approaches to education, and we are collectively educating over 50,000 students every year. Um, so we're a a great group of institutions um, that essentially um, are really kind of leading in these areas of education um, in the arts in the US and Canada. Um, through ACAD and Slide Room, you have the opportunity to um, upload five up to five pieces of your artwork to Slide Room um, and select which ACAD schools you would like feedback from. And then we'll essentially email you a portfolio review. So again, a great opportunity to get a little bit of feedback. Um, this ACAD portfolio review is free for students to use. Generally, it is for high school students or students in college who might be interested in transferring, um, but it'll give you the chance to get a little bit more familiar with the Slide Room platform as well. You might also connect individually with the institutions you are interested in to see if you can have a one-on-one -on -one portfolio review. Um, right now, CCA, for example, is doing those things virtually, much like this presentation. And then just to speak briefly about CCA before opening up for questions, um, California College of the Arts is a fully accredited private nonprofit school of art and design located in the San Francisco Bay Area. We've been around for over 100 years. We were founded during the arts and crafts movement. Um, but given our location and all this awesome stuff that's happened with uh, design and technology and whatnot, we've been able to roll those types of things into our programs as well. So I'll show you a full list of our majors in a moment, but one thing that sets us apart from a lot of other art and design schools is our STEM designated programs. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And there's a big push, especially here in the US, for students to pursue programs that fall into those categories. Um, an international student can stay in the United States for one year upon successful completion of an accredited program. But if you complete a STEM designated program, you can apply for a two year extension to that opportunity and potentially stay in the US for three years after graduating. So at CCA, if you're interested in animation, interaction design or architecture, we could be a good option because of that STEM designation. We are a pretty small institution we have about 1,450 undergraduate students, but we are very diverse. So 42% of our student body is coming from about 50 countries around the world. And this has led us to be ranked one of the top 10 most diverse campuses in the US. Um, our location also affords us a great opportunity to connect with a variety of different companies. Students are interning in over uh, 600 uh, positions every year and over 200 companies are physically coming to campus every year to work with our students. For the most part, our faculty are all practicing professionals working for companies and in industries our students want to be a part of. 
So for example, an animation teacher might work at Pixar or a graphic design teacher might work at Google. We have an eight to one student to faculty ratio. So you have a really good opportunity to connect closely with those individuals. And we've been ranked the number one art and design school in the US for return on investment. This is a quick look at the undergraduate programs that we offer. For the most part, these are four year bachelor of fine art programs. The biggest exception to this is the NAB accredited five year bachelor of architecture program. Our admissions requirements are pretty standard. You'll find that a lot of art schools in the US will have comparable kinds of admissions processes, generally um, an application and an essay. A lot of us are on the Common App. Um, CCA utilizes both the Common App and our own internal application, either one is fine. We do also need your transcripts, a letter of recommendation, a proof of English proficiency. And in the case of CCA, we are um, requiring 10 to 15 pieces of artwork for that portfolio. We're on a rolling admission, but any first year student who applies by February 1st is automatically considered for a merit-based scholarship. Any transfer student who applies by March 1st is automatically considered for a merit scholarship. Deadlines might vary a little bit from institution to institution, but again, this is a little, a little standard. And um, that's about it. <laughs> so pass it back along. Or if you have questions specifically for me or for CCA, um, internationaladmissions at cca.edu um, is a great place to connect with us. If you'd like more information about CCA, um, you can visit cca.edu slash international to sign up. Um, again, uh, give you an opportunity to schedule an appointment to meet with a counselor um, get portfolio tips and more. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. Actually, we have some questions. Okay. Um, and this is, uh, what is the importance of the portfolio in the admission financial aid application process? So this will also vary a little bit from school to school. Um, in general, a portfolio, when considering a merit scholarship, it is at least 50% of the equation. So usually schools are looking at your academics and the strength of your portfolio to determine that. Some of my colleagues from other ACAD institutions will say that the portfolio is more important than the academics, maybe like a 60-40 or even a 75-25% kind of spread. Um, but the portfolio is generally, uh, like we mentioned earlier, one of the most important pieces of that overall process. Super. Um, another question, Mike, do you consider retired adults who may want to reinvent their lives? Definitely. Um, we would consider, at CCA, we would call someone who already has a, a bachelor's degree. Um, we would call them either a, a second degree student or a post-baccalaureate student. But um, we don't have any specific sort of like education requirements. As long as someone's completed high school, they're able to apply for an undergraduate degree program. Uh, we do have students every year that fall into that category that are changing careers, um, want to do something new, whatever the case is. You might also think about a graduate program. I didn't talk really about the graduate programs, each of our grad programs have very specific kinds of requirements and the portfolios will have very specific types of requirements. So in that case, you're, you're much better off directly connecting with the, the school um, and talking to them about the, that um, process. But in, in the case of someone who's considering going back to school, you might also reach out to discuss if a graduate program would be of benefit to you as well. And some have, again, a little bit more flexibility with what your background is or if you're switching careers um, than others. But that's something we're more than happy to talk to you about to give you options. In your experience, Mike, in CCA, that has happened before? That students have like uh, switched careers and come back? Yes. Oh, definitely. Yes. yes. I actually, prior to working just in international admissions, I was the um, the assistant director of transfer admissions. And every year I worked with students who um, were considered again, like second degree or post back students who are coming back um, for additional education or switching careers or whatnot. Yes. Another question, Mike. Uh, and this is more 
into the materials. What is better, digital or paperwork? So one is not inherently better than the other. Um, we, I do know that in some instances, um, especially younger students are automatically drawn to digital works. You're working on a tablet, like a, you know, an iPad, or maybe you have a Cintiq or something like that. Um, there have been students have, who have only submitted digital work and who have not submitted anything traditional. That's not necessarily bad, but do keep in mind, um, it's always nice to see a variety of different materials. So if you do work digitally, it's nice to play around with some traditional works as well, um, and even vice versa if you have that opportunity. But note that in almost any art program, especially here in the US, um, when you take you know, your drawing one class, it's gonna be pencil and paper or charcoal and paper. It's not gonna be a digital drawing class. So if you're always using digital or you're always leaning on digital and you don't use traditional materials, that's something I would uh, challenge you to start doing now. Um, even if you don't wind up including a lot of traditional work in your portfolio, it's something that you're going to, um, you're going to have to do in class anyway, in your studio classes. Um, and also, you know, for the most part, I imagine that a lot of you are probably young artists and you shouldn't be um, what I would consider like a one trick pony, right? You should have a variety of experiences playing around with a bunch of different things. Um, you shouldn't be just be cranking out the same kinds of work over and over and over again. So really, again, challenge yourself to do things that are different from what you would normally do. Super. Okay, another question, uh, Mike. I want to study architecture, but don't have any material for my portfolio. Can I include some pictures of building design style I am aiming for? Um, the short answer is yes. Um, the more complicated answer is it will depend on what school you're applying to. A school like CCA has what is called a core foundation year. So regardless of which major you're interested in, architecture, animation, film, you're going to take drawing, 2D design, 3D design, and 4D design in your first year. You'll also have two open electives. So you can play around in this case with architecture courses. If you're trying to decide between architecture and animation, maybe you take one of each. Um, or if you've never done glass before, done textiles before, you can take electives in those areas. At CCA, you wouldn't be locked into a major until your second year. Because we have that exploratory interdisciplinary first year, you are not required to have artwork that specifically pertains to your area of interest. That is completely okay for us. Other institutions, however, might have more strict requirements if they don't have the same type of foundation year. So that's where a little bit of that research comes into play. You, you will want to check with the schools that you're interested in to see if they are okay with that. For the most part, the answer will be yes, but you don't just want to make that assumption. It might be you know, specific from school to school. Okay, perfect. Uh, what kind of work is, is it expected from students applying to architecture? Um, again, it, it can be a variety of different things. We have had students who are applying with traditional kinds of artwork that they're doing in school, you know, with uh, drawing and painting. Um, or still life works. Um, and we've had the other side of that, you know, um, range where students maybe have gone to a pre-college program where they're attending a school that gives them the opportunity to do some even interior design or drafting. Um, models can, can work, you know, so anything like uh, a floor plan um, can, be, can be beneficial. Um, playing around with three-dimensional objects for students who are interested in anything from architecture to interior design to sculpture. So thinking about those spatial relationships can be really nice to see in a portfolio. Again, not necessarily required, but something to think about. If you're interested in architecture and you haven't done anything architectural before, again, um, don't, don't be worried, don't feel bad. Um, but maybe now when you sit down to draw something, instead of drawing like a portrait or instead of drawing your dog, um, draw like the interior of your bedroom or look out your window and draw the buildings across the street. So think a little bit more about, again, those architectural kinds of elements that you're interested in, um, and that could be a good place to start. Perfect. Uh, Mike, is there a specific number of pieces? Uh, the, the question is, how many pieces should be in my portfolio? 
Again, that will depend from institution to institution, usually anywhere between 10 and 20 pieces of the strongest, most recent artwork. Um, CCA, for example, is asking for 10 to 15 pieces in most instances. Perfect. And um, what are the most common careers in visual arts? Well, we have a whole separate presentation that talks about careers in art and design. Um, you know, it really, it, it depends. Um, if you think about, like, just, to, you know, take a step back, look in the room that you're in, your bedroom or your kitchen or wherever you are, everything that you see that is not already existing in nature was designed by somebody, right? So the chair you're sitting in, the computer you're at, the clothes that you're wearing, the, the table, the room, everything was designed by somebody. So that means there are specific like art jobs, right? Animators, architects, interior designers, graphic designers. Um, these are all right, pretty common careers. But a lot of a lot of companies will either have internal art houses or will work with freelance companies or other kinds of companies to do everything from product design to that graphic design to fashion design, um, textile design, pattern design, stationery. It's it's really quite quite broad. Um, there are things that might be a little bit more niche, like maybe costume design for movies or for theater versus fashion design. Um, but the career fields in the arts are expected to continue to grow over the next, um, next decade, decade and a half. It's really a great time to be involved in the arts. So I know that doesn't specifically answer the question, but it really, it, it is very varied and it depends what you know, what you're interested in and what you want to do. Um, but you can also reach out um, to the international admissions email address or even just go to our website, cca.edu. Each program um, has its own page on our website and there's information about alumni stories. Um, we have uh, career development information and whatnot. So that'll help give you some, some more ideas of what people are doing in those fields. Super. And about the programs, uh, precisely in CCA, like which is the most the most common uh, program in sure. CCA? So our our most popular right now are um, animation, architecture, graphic design, illustration, industrial design, and painting and drawing. Um, they right now I think animation is is our number one. Um, like most popular, but it really, you know, it shifts a little bit from year to year, but those six are the, are generally the ones that enroll the most students. Perfect. And the last question that we have received is, is there any change in the admissions, admissions process due to COVID-19 to the current pandemic? Um, nothing specific as far as the requirements. Um, we do at CCA, we have a very holistic application process. So we're looking at all the pieces of your application, all the materials you're submitting, what you're writing in your essays, what your recommenders are writing about you. So if, if COVID-19 has impacted you negatively, has uh, negatively impacted your grades, um, your finances, whatever the case might be, it's important to, to address those things, um, either in the application itself or by emailing us or whatever the case is. Um, we are a little bit flexible with some of the deadlines, right? So I mentioned February 1 um, to be considered for scholarship. If you need a little bit more time, you know, a week, two weeks, um, as long as you're in touch with us, as long as we know what's going on, we can advocate for you. We can try to be flexible, whatever the case is. Um, but there's no, you know, no real specific ways that that has changed. I believe the Common App, there's a section there that asks about, um, there's a um, educational disruption section, um, but a section for you to add more information and whatnot. So, you know, just make sure you're reading through the applications or, or reading through that information and selecting selecting those things. Really, I think the biggest, the biggest difference um, for us has been giving students the opportunity to take a semester virtually. Um, prior to this year, you know, all of our programs are 100% in person on campus. Um, and even for this fall, fall 2021, we have decided to give students the opportunity to do the fall semester virtually. So until things have really calmed down, you know, the vaccine is more prevalent, 
um, that the world has the pandemic under control a little bit more and we have everybody back on campus, there are some things that are being flexible on that end. Um, but, you know, we're more than happy to answer more specific questions if when you have them. Perfect. Thank you, Mike. There is no more questions. Um, yeah, Excellent. we don't have more questions. But, uh, well, we want to invite you as well to coming events to our audience. Uh, the next one is on February the 2nd, the 3rd and the 4th is a showcase and is highly recommended because it's about community colleges. So we have found that a lot of our advices and people that is uh, coming close to us and asking about um, more information for studying in the US, they don't know about community colleges and the two plus two program they can offer. Those are two year um, program institutions and you can transfer your credits to a four year um, institution. So Mike, uh, for instance, in your case, you have this as well, this uh, kind of agreements with community colleges, right? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. So we invite you. There is the Bitly link where you can um, you can register your attendance, uh, and uh, there is another also another um, info session next week, the twenty seventh. If you want to know about opportunity funds, uh, um, that is only for Mexicans, but for the people that is visiting virtually us and joining today, um, just check if, if in, in Education USA in your country they have this opportunity funds available uh, for for you. Um, then uh, we have received uh, a lot of uh, well, some messages that there have been some technical issues. We have experiencing some uh, technical issues uh, also in Facebook Live. So we will send, uh, let me just send a link where you will find um this recorded session you can you can see uh, there later on just give some um some days uh, and we will have this session so you can review it completely um, sorry that there will there were uh, some technical issues um, and if we can go mike please to the next uh, slide is just to show uh, our official website uh, from Education USA. So you can find, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, you can go there, you will find a lot of information, um, a lot of uh, questions and, answer, and answers uh, over there. And um, as well, you can find uh, your Education USA Advising Center. Um, at the country you you are living at. Uh, I will send the link, just give me a second, uh, where you will find um, the, uh, the recorded session. I want to thank you all in the audience um, to, to join today for your questions. And uh, also thank you very much, Mike, for joining for for, for, for all this valuable information for the people that wants to, um, to study arts and all, all these uh, programs that you have mentioned. So they know how okay. to create their uh, visual arts portfolio. This is very valuable. Thank you very much for, for this and looking forward for, for other events together during this year. Definitely. Um, Thank you all for, for coming. It was my pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity to connect. Thank you. Thank you so much to you. Uh, I will just give you the, uh, the link through the chat. Just a second. Perfect. Otherwise, you will find it uh, as uh, Education USA Mexico in YouTube. So uh, that's the channel uh, or Education USA. I send it to all of you through the chat. And thank you very much. Looking forward to see you all joining for further sessions.